evidence that not all sermonettes make Christianettes. Our Thursday evening sermonettes, if we can call them that, certainly are uplifting. Thank you for your work, George. You'll see some similar things or hear some similar things right now. Ezekiel 14. We already covered this text except for the very end. Ezekiel 14. The elders came to me. They sat down before me, verse 1. Verse 3, they had idols set up in their hearts. And God asked, should I be consulted of them or by them at all? And then he answers them two ways. Verse 6, he gives them what they need to hear. Repent and turn away from your idols. Verse 12, he tells them what they don't want to hear, but what they came for, probably. They came to find out what's going on back in Jerusalem. And he says to them, in verse 13, he talks about a famine. In verse 15, he talks about beasts. In verse 17, he talks about a sword. And in verse 19, he talks about a plague. Each time he had mentioned, even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were there, they would only save themselves. We made the point last week, if only I could be like a Noah, a Daniel, or a Job. And if you're a living, it's not too late. Verse 21. This is basically new material. For thus says the Lord, how much more when I send my four severe judgments against Jerusalem, sword, famine, wild beast, and plague, to cut off man and beast from it. It's going down. It's going to happen. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. That's what they want to know. Here they have the answer. Verse 22 changes the tone a little bit. Yet, behold, survivors will be left in it who will be brought out, both sons and daughters. Behold, they are going to come forth to you, and you will see their conduct and actions. Then you will be comforted by the calamity, or for the calamity, which I have brought against Jerusalem for everything which I have brought upon it. They will comfort you when you see their conduct and actions, for you will know that I have not done in vain whatever I did to it, declares the Lord God. Do you think that he would see good behavior and it would cause them to be comforted? Or he would see their bad behavior and it would cause him to be comforted. You think it's the good behavior? I think it's bad. He thinks it's bad. You know what? From my point, it doesn't matter. Because it's either I'm destroying this place because they're so evil that when you see them, you'll say, God was right. Or it's these people are bad, but when they go through my discipline... They'll be good. They'll be well behaved. And you'll say, you know what? God's method was good. So either way, you end up in the situation where God says, when I'm done, you will not question my methods. You won't question what I have done. You'll see it. Which I find interesting. I, I know several times. I lean with George. I think it's bad behavior. I don't really have certainty in saying that. Um, I do know that several times in the previously we've already read when, when Ezekiel sees God destroying Jerusalem, he says, Lord, what are you doing? And it seems to be he's questioning God, God's methods, God's motives, God's chosen way. And God is saying, don't worry when I'm done, whatever it is. God is saying, well, don't worry when I'm done, you'll be on the same page as I am. Notice he said, when you see their conduct, then you will be comforted. Well, shouldn't he have been comforted anyway? 
no matter if he actually saw the end result. Because granted, do we always see the end result of, of, of God says do it this way? Well, I'll only do it that way if I can see the end result. Should that be our attitude? Not at all. No, God says do it this way. God says, this is what I want in this certain situation. Okay. I might not even understand it. But I'll be comforted, not when I see that it works. I'll be comforted just to know that that's, that's what God wants. We need to have more of that attitude. A couple things from this. Notice, some people behave so badly, you can just look at them and tell. Or, some people behave so righteously, you can just look at them and tell. That's someone that George was just talking about for a second. No matter what, Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Some people behave so badly that they're good only for judgment. No, it doesn't have to remain that way. They can repent. But that is, in fact, the reality. Look, these people are only good for me to judge them. Both of these, their bad behavior are sad, but they are both facts, aren't they? Comments or questions on the end of chapter 4? It takes a righteous prophet to recognize what God is saying he will recognize here. In other words, <laughs> an evil person watching this still wouldn't understand yeah. why they had been punished. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, and, and when we when we when we ask the question, why do bad things happen to good people? <laughs> there's kind of an asterisk attached to the word good there. And, yeah. and that doesn't mean the question is asked with ill intention or anything like that. However, um, the more you understand God's perspective, the more the more unfortunate you can feel, right. I guess, in some ways, yeah. <clears throat> you said that the evil would not recognize the good done even concerning him we have much to say it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing and, and we wouldn't really consider that person to be quote unquote evil it shows how much closer oh they're the evil ones no I'll understand it because I'm not evil well I could be this <clears throat> So Ezekiel 15. Ezekiel 15. It's very short. It's a parable. And then the application. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, how is the wood of the vine better than any wood or of a branch which is among the trees of the forest? Can wood be taken from it to make anything or can man take a peg from it on which to hang any vessel? And the rhetorical answers are no, it's a vine. We only do one thing with vines, and we know what that is. If it has been put into the fire for fuel, and fire has consumed both its ends, and its middle part has been charred. In other words, if the whole thing has been touched by fire, what's it good for? This thing that's only good for burning to begin with, once it's been burned, what's it good for? Well, nothing. And fire has consumed both ends and its middle part has been charred. Is it then useful for anything? Behold, while it was inta is intact, it is not made into anything. How much less when the fire has consumed it and it is charred, it can it still be made into anything? The, a vine, it's garbage. It's gar Unless it's producing fruit, it's garbage. Burn the vine. And then when you burn the vine, it's still more garbage. Therefore, here's the application. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, as the wood of the vine among the trees of the forest, which I have given to the fire for fuel, so I have given up the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I am, and I set my face against them. Though they have come out of the fire, yet the fire will consume them. Then you will know that I am the Lord. When I have set my face against them, thus I will make the land desolate, because they have acted unfaithfully, declares the Lord. What's going to happen back to Jerusalem? It's going to be burned or destroyed. Some of it will be burned, but the point is, it's worthless. I've got to destroy it. Can you think of any passages in the New Testament or anywhere that talk about similar, they use similar language. In fact, George, I think, alluded to one if he didn't say it outright. You got this vine, you got this branch, and I'm going to burn it. Can you think of anywhere in the New Testament that says anything like that?
John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Bear fruit. We sing the song, Bear Precious Fruit. Because if you don't, you'll be burned up, right? John 15, Matthew 13 talks about the same idea, Hebrews 6, that we've been going through. If we're not producing food, fruit, uh, the food is Matthew 7, Romans 11 talks about God didn't spare the natural branches. He might burn you up if you become prideful, right? So in the Old Testament, you have this idea of the vine being, if it's not bearing fruit, God will burn it up in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. What's the point? What? Yeah, well, okay, first point is this. God is the same. Right? He uses the same analogy, the same picture in the Old Testament and the New Testament to make the exact same point. So the question is, am I useful to God? Am I bearing fruit? Or is burning or being burned up? Is, is that all I'm good for? I'm just good for being burned up. That's it. Wait. Yeah? You often make the statement fellowship will take care of itself. Hmm. And one of the things I think you mean by that is the fact that God already recognizes the reality. The rest of us are just kind of catching up to that. Yeah. And I think I think this is also what's going on here. They sort of assumed or, or the argument that isn't really stated but that you can see in there is that people are going, but God you know, if you do that to us, then what good are we for? And he's kind of shrugging saying, you're worthless already. Is this a trick question? You, yeah. You already made it clear that the, I, we're, we're not losing anything here. Yeah. Yep. Good point. So, of course, I'm a Christian, right? So I'm not evil. I mean, obviously, I'm a Christian. I'm not I'm not only good for being burned because I'm a Christian, right? I was baptized. Now, 20 years ago. So 20 years ago in a month and five days. So I'm, I'm, I'm fine. I, I can't be burned. I'm, there's no way possible that I am worthy only of being burned up because I'm a Christian. I have been one for 20 years, one month, and five days. True? But I have good works. Let's assume for the sake of argument. It's true. I, I mean, I've, I've been diligently working. I've been working, working, working. Can we think of other people who are working, 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 yet rejected the truth, right? Yeah, the Jews, right? So you have to have, oh, but I have faith. And James says to them, Paul says to the Jew who has all the works, no, you need some faith too. James says to the Jew who has all the faith, no, you need some works too, right? So we, am I worthy of being, oh, I'm fine. I was baptized. No, that's, that's not the role, is it? Uh, Brian. You're adding a word that takes away from God is I. Ah. Your pride can destroy you. Even the works that you have done, when you're saying, I have done this, I have done that, I can't be lost. Well, yes, you can. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, is with the Jews, they were they were just completely disobedient to the things of God. They they thought they hated the prophets that were speaking the truth. They loved the ones that didn't. They played the harlot. They did all these things. And when it came to God's messengers telling them, "This is what's going to happen," you're like, "Oh, but I'm an Israelite." Right? from this list. But the thing is, is God wants us to play full. And that's the problem. If we do all the other things and yet are not faithful, we're just putting on an act. Yeah. I, I mentioned I was baptized 20 years ago. That's my heritage. Right? That's my that's my that's my past time. I was baptized. That's that's the Jews saying, no, I'm I'm an Israelite. I can say, well, I'm a Christian. But just because of something I did 20 years ago doesn't necessarily have an impact on me right now. In fact, the impact might be to increase my will, right? Jonathan, yeah. Um, the question, am I useful to God, though you don't 
don't mean it that way, as a little bit of a sound of, you know, are you doing something for God? Obviously, we can't do anything. You can, Jesus is a special case. He, he provided something that God needed to get done. The rest of us, you could do everything absolutely perfectly for your entire life, and you would have provided nothing to God that you didn't have right. otherwise. So, you know, we're, we're doing actual work, trying to spread his word, that kind of stuff. But if God just said, jump up and down all the time, and nothing was ever accomplished, it's effectively the same from God's perspective. It's just something that he says to do. You're supposed to do it, and you can't say, well, you know, I, I, was, I wasn't jumping a foot in the air, but eight inches. So it was, you know, God, he knows everything. You're not providing anything to him anyway. So you have to fill up the extent that he is expecting of you. Otherwise, it's not good enough, right? which is kind of scary. Matt, all of us have fallen short, right? Okay. I'm done with chapter 15. Wasn't that fun? All right, chapter 16. Anybody bring their questions or their answers? We've got some. We've got some. Okay. Chapter 16. Verses 1 through 5. Describe Israel before God. Just give me a summary there, Autumn. Um, I just wrote dirty. Dirty. Anybody, anything else? What, Marcy, would you have? Hopeless. Hopeless, George. Abandoned mud. Oh. I'm sorry, second word. Abandoned mud. Mud. Mixed breed. <laughs> would you have? Hated from birth. Yeah, hated from birth. Verses 6 through 14. Describe Israel with God. Uh, Jonathan. I don't have answers. Yeah, but you look like you're coming up with one. <laughs> okay, Jonathan. Uh, uh, John. I put uh, love and blessed and famous. Yeah, famous. Interesting. I think I have famous on there. Um, yeah, we get the idea. This verses 15 through 34. How did Israel quote unquote repay God? Um, Autumn. By worshiping idols. Yeah. And verses 35 through 43. So how would God, quote unquote, repay Israel, Marcy? Feeding my adulterous tendencies. Yeah. And verses 44 through 59. To whom did God compare Israel? Two answers. And was Israel better or worse than they? And to what would this lead? George, you like this one. Uh, Samaria and Sodom. Yep. They were worse. Yep. And what I got is that this would lead to Samaria and Sodom's restoration. Perfect. Oh, okay. Oh. I feel That's like I got out on a limb. <laughs> but that's in the text, so <laughs> I had to say perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, I believe that they're making, a, God's making a, using that specific, obviously God is using them to make a point to Israel. I believe that is still making a point to Israel. We'll get into that. Verses 60 through 62, what would the Lord do in the end? Um, John. Yes, and what would they know in the end? Everybody knows this one all the time. They would know who the Lord was. Okay, so chapters 16 through 19. Would you know it? More denunciations against Israel. Oh, huh, interesting. Um, that's the text that we're covering. Chapter 16. This could be fuller. I just wrote Israel's ingratitude for God and his provisions. That's in there. Of course, there could be a whole lot more to this description. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, so verse 1, it, 1 through 5, Israel before God, and I just wrote worthless, right? Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abomination. Say, uh, thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, your origin and your birth are from the land of the Canaanite. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. Is that a compliment? No. What is the point? What do we know about the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Jebusites and all the ites? What do we know about them? Right. And God said, I'm going to kick them out of their land because they are so evil. Their iniquity is not yet complete. Come back in 400 years when it's really bad, as bad as it is right now, it's going to get really bad. And here, those people are called Jerusalem's mom and dad. The point being, Jerusalem, it's, you're in a rough situation in your birth. As, now, this is not a one-for-one -one historical account of, but the point. 
As for your birth, on the day that you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water for cleansing. You were not rubbed with salt or even wrapped in clothes. No, I looked with pity on you to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you. Rather, you were thrown out into the open fields. That happened all the time back then. That was their way of getting rid of an unwanted child. That is the point. You were unwanted. Nobody wanted you. For you were abhorred on the day you were born. Verses 6 through 14, Israel, because of God, alive, married, fabulous, fat, and famous. When I passed by you and saw you squirming in your blood, I said to you while you were in your blood, live. Oh, by the way, stop here. Verses 1 through 5, you were rejected, you were a baby, you were helpless. I came, number one. Verses 1 through 5, you were helpless and wretched. And I came, and without any help from you, said to you, live, and you lived. What's that a picture of? What does it remind you of? Say it again. Yeah, it, it actually does that too. Yes. Let there be life. <laughs> right, right. I wasn't thinking of that. You're thinking of Christ. Yes, and, and now I was in my sin. Now, this is not actually a picture of that, but the picture fits it too, right? And, of course, we understand that basically any time God is talking, look, you were all lost in your sin, and I made you alive. So we can see the parallels. We can make some personal applications. John, did you want to say something? Well, I, I thought you were looking for uh, Egypt and Exodus. Uh, Yes, that would be uh, more specific to what this is talking about, but I am going for the, don't miss the personal application here, saved by grace, right? I know sometimes we don't like to say that, we're saved by grace, but guess what? We're saved by grace. <laughs> so, pound it into your head. George? When I passed you by, I saw you squirming in your blood. I said to you while you were yet in your blood lived. Yes, I said to you while you were in your blood lived. I made you numerous, like plants of the field. Then you grew up, became tall, and reached the age for fine uh, ornaments. Your breasts were formed, and your hair where it had grown, and you were naked and bare. I passed you by and saw you, and behold, you were at the time for love. So I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. I also swore to you and entered into a covenant with you so that you became mine, declares the Lord God. Then I bathed you with water, washed off your blood from you, and anointed you with oil. I also clothed you with the embroidered cloth and put sandals of porpoise skin on your feet. And I wrapped you with fine linen and covered with you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your hands and a necklace about your neck. I also put a ring in your nostril, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your dress was of fine linen silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour, honey, and oil. You were exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty. Then your fame went forth among the nations on account of your beauty, for it was perfect because of your splendor, which I bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. Don't miss a point in here, husbands. Treat your wives in a way that she'll understand. Oh, I am precious to my husband. Although that is not his point here, but he assumes that to make his point here, right? So, he uh, marries her and gives her all that she wants and more. 15 through 34, Israel forsakes and forgets God. But you, you said, thank you, God. Thank you for all that you have done for me. I love you. I'll never leave you. I'll always appreciate, remember where I was and who you have made me now and what you do for me. I am not worthy of it all. How sad. But. May I in my life not do this, but do what I just said, right? All that. But you trusted in your beauty and played the harlot because of your fame. You poured out your harlot trees on every passerby who might be willing. That's what the New American Standard translates that. You took some of your clothes made for yourself, high places of various colors, and played the harlot on them, which never should have come about or happened. You also took your beautiful jewels made of my gold and of my silver, which I had given you, and made for yourself male images that you might play the harlot with them. Then you took your embroidered cloth and covered them 
and offered my oil and my incense before them. Also my bread, which I gave you, fine flour, oil, and honey, with which I fed you, you would offer before them for a soothing aroma. So it happened, declares the Lord God. Let me stop right there. I read this commentary. It is a fearful thing to fall in love with the gifts of God, with the gifts God has blessed us with, and to forget the God who gave them. This applies to all blessings of every kind. What say you now, you who have prostituted your talents to your own progress, you who have used his tongue to speak for your own praise or slander his creature, in other words, another person, you who have used your eyes to pour over filth and your ears to listen to smut. That's exactly the point, right? Now, I understand that this is written for national Israel and all the sin that they had gotten themselves in, but the picture as it applies to us, this is exactly right. God has given us all this stuff. And he didn't even mention stuff. He mentions my lips, my ears, and my eyes. Again, this goes along with what George had said earlier. Verse 20, as if it weren't bad enough. Moreover, you took your sons and daughters whom you had borne to me and sacrificed them to idols to be devoured. Were your harlotry so small a matter, you slaughtered my children and offered them up to idols by causing them to pass through the fire. Did you note whose children they were in here? His own. Say it again. They were, they were God's children. You slaughtered my children. The poor children. Murdered by mothers who were eager to have their children or their child honored by being sacrificed by being sacrificed to Moab. But these were God's children. They forgot that, didn't they? The babies they brought forth were the gift of God, and the parents were stewards of a trust. And are we today any less responsible? Or are children any less give gifts of God? To what will we give them? On what altar will we sacrifice them? Will we offer them to the great God education? All this is, he highlights it this way. Or will we offer them on the great altar of athletics? Or more generally, will we lay them on the all-consuming altar of success? Mother, these mothers in Israel are here brought under the judgment before God for giving their babies to gods other than the Lord God. See that you give yours to none or no one but the Lord God Almighty, for only in him are they successful or secure. Don't have pity on yourself or on them. With the decision, with this with a decision of the will, well thought out. Deliver them over to the Lord, and you'll have done them the greatest favor that you could do them. That's for mothers. And obviously for fathers also. Verse 22. Besides all of your abominations and harlotries, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare, squirming in your blood. You notice that? While they were sinning, what didn't they remember? The days of their youth. Can you think of a passage in the New Testament that basically says, look, people who aren't hitting the target, it's because they've forgotten the days of their youth. Now, I totally paraphrase that. Do you know what I'm talking about? Second Peter, uh, yeah, Second Peter 1. Now for this very reason, applying all diligence in your faith, supply excellence in moral excellence, knowledge, knowledge, self-control. This is Second Peter chapter 1, verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless, neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Exact same situation. Look, Israel, when you ran off and you became the Charlie and did all those disgusting things, you forgot where you came from. Look, Lee. When you're not increasing, and we're not even talking about this hideous sin, Lee. We're talking about here are some positive characteristics that you're not working on. No, you're not bad. You're not evil. You're a pretty good guy. But you're not working on these positive characteristics. And if you're not working on them, you've forgotten the purification from your former sin. 
may it never be me. Comment or question, raise your hand, interrupt me, throw something. So, verse 23, it came about after all your wickedness, as, as if burning your children wasn't bad enough, that you built for yourself a shrine and made for yourself a high place in every square. You built for yourself a high place at the top of every street and made your beauty abominable and you spread your legs to every passerby to multiply your har harlotry. You also played the harlot with the Egyptians in verse 26. In verse 28, the Assyrians. And because you were not satisfied with the Egyptians, you went to the Assyrians. And then you played the harlot with them and still were not satisfied. Verse 29, they go to Chaldea. And yet even with this, you were not satisfied. They get worse and they get worse and they get worse. By the way, is there something about sin that it will never, never satisfy you? Because we are only created to be fulfilled by doing what is right. That's when we'll have fulfillment. Sin will never, ever satisfy us. It'll only get worse and worse. Verse 30, how languishing is your heart, declares the Lord God. While you do all these things, the actions of the bold-faced harlot. When you built your shrine at the beginning of every street and made your high place in every square in disdaining money, you were not like a harlot. They were doing it for free, is the point. You adulterous wife, who takes strangers instead of her husband. Men give gifts to all the harlots. You give your gifts to all of your lovers. They were out harlotring the harlots. Verse 34. Thus you are different from those women in your harlotries, in that no one plays the harlot as you do, because you give money and no money is given you. How disgusting. That's how bad. God is saying, painting with this disgusting picture, Israel... You wonder why I'm doing to Jerusalem what I'm doing to Jerusalem. It's because of your sin. You are worse than the nations. Verse 38. Thus I will judge you like women who commit adultery. Verses 44. God compares Israel and Judah to Samaria and Sodom and say you've acted more corruptly. He's saying the same thing again with pictures that they understand again. You remember Sodom... Was Sodom, did it go uh, the way that we all want to go? No, and why? Because of their sin, right? Verse 44. Everyone who quotes Proverbs will quote this proverb concerning you, saying, like mother, like daughter. Now, that can go either way, right? If you've got a good mom, you want, as, you want that said. But if you have an evil mom, you don't. Well, you are the daughter of your mother, Verse 46, your older, excuse me, verse 45, your mother is a Hittite and your father is an Amorite. So if you're the daughter of your mother and your mother is a Hittite, now your older sister is Samaria, who lives north of you with her daughters, and your younger sister, who lives south of you, is Sodom with her daughters. Yet you have not merely walked in their ways or done according to their abominations. They looked at Sodom and Samaria and said, there's nothing wrong with what they do. They couldn't identify. They lived in sin. As if it were too little, you acted more corruptly in all your conduct than they. How sad when this is God's people. Now as we skim through this, in verse 53, Verse 52 says, you acted more abominably than they, abominably than they did. They are more in the right than you are. Verse 53, nevertheless, I will restore their, and if you're reading out of the New American Standard, it says captivity. This word is used 30 times in the Old Testament, 20 of those times it is translated fortunes. I think it would have been better translated here, although that's just my personal opinion. I'm going to read it that way, like the ESV, I think, if anybody's got one, or the NIV. Anybody got an ESV? Nobody. I will restore their fortunes. It's the same word. It's usually translated fortunes. I'm going to read it that way. And the fortunes of Sodom and her daughters, the fortune of Samaria and her daughters, and along with them, your own fortunes. In order that you may bear your humiliation and feel ashamed for all that you have done when you become a consolation to them. 
your sister Sodom with her daughters and Samaria with her daughters will return to their former state and you with your daughters will also return to your former state. Now we understand that God has made a promise to Israel. He said, look, I'm going to raise you up again. I'm going to bring you back. But if they, this is the way I interpret this passage, it could be wrong. I know this is true, the principle, I, I think it applies to this passage. If Israel is worse than Sodom, in order for God to be a just God, to bring Syri uh, Israel back, who else would he have to bring back? Everybody who's better. And in this case, all he's talking about is Sodom. Sodom, as bad as they are, if I'm going to be just, if I'm going to bring you up, you're worse than they are, I've got to bring them up too. Obviously make the point that that's how bad you are. You're worse, again he's making the same point, you're worse than Sodom. Now this whole chapter 16 paints horrible pictures any way you look at it. Either a harlot or Sodom. Which do you want? How does the chapter end? Verse 60. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. What? I don't think I would be so merciful, would I? But then again, as Isaiah 55 says, God's ways are not man's ways. And that is exactly the context. What? Just come to me. I'll forgive you. As bad as you are, I'll forgive you. Why in the world would you do that? Because I wouldn't. God says, well, I'm not like man. I'll actually put up with you. Thank God for that. Verse 61. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your sisters, both your older and younger. And I will give them to you as daughters, but not because of your covenant. Thus I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord, so that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your humiliation when I have forgiven you for all that you have done, declares the Lord. There seems to be, it can be either, it's one of two ways. The idea is this. I'll forgive you, or, or you will be ashamed, and then I'll forgive you. And that's true. That's the way God works. In this case, it can actually be translated the other way or applied the other way. I'll forgive you, and then you'll be ashamed. Do you remember in Acts chapter 2 when they had killed the Messiah? In justice, what should God have done? Killed them. But yet in mercy, he tells them, no, that one that you killed is actually reigning in heaven right now, and this is a sign of that. You killed them. So instead of justly killing them, he shows them mercy. And what's the end result? They're pierced to the heart. Paul, Saul, ran around killing Christians or contributing to it directly. In justice, God should have killed them. But God, in mercy, appeals to Paul, and at the end, Paul says, I was the worst sinner ever. So, there is some parenting advice in here. Sometimes be merciful, and your child will break down in front of you and cry tears that he never would have cried if you'd spanked his bottom to begin with, right? But thank God that God understands how to manipulate us, doesn't he? At least he understands how to manipulate those who will allow him to. Right? Comments or questions on this? We yes. All the way back up in verse yes. 15. 15? 15. Per, am I making too much of this? Or, he says, but you trusted in your beauty and played, played the whore. Um... Because of your renown. In other words, you, you became careless and forgetful. And then later on, in verse <coughs> 26, you played the whore to provoke me to anger. 
has 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 there been a progression in terms of the reason for their sin? Because by the end of this, he says it again, because you weren't satisfied. In other words, the first time you were you were careless and flippant, and it was wrong then. I'm, I'm not trying to make a, a point that it was less wrong, but it was wrong then. But you, you kind of got into it because you're careless, and then you did it because you were belligerent and deliberately trying to provoke me. And lastly, you're just out of control. The, the progression of yeah, I, I I don't think that's too far to get out of this text. Farther than you want to go and keeps you longer than you want to stay and costs you more than you want to pay. Mm. Chapter seventeen. What was going to happen to him and why? The Prince of Israel would die because of breaking the covenant? And I wrote both of those with a question mark. See, that's not what I got. Yeah. What'd you get? I was right. I said the king of Jerusalem was to be taken by Babylon. Is that not in there? What? <laughs> what was the last part? It was not, not in there? It, what did you say? I said maybe that wasn't in there. I don't know. I said the king of Jerusalem. I said Zedekiah would go to Babylon. <laughs> She's writer than I was. Well, but Zedekiah died. I yeah, gave yeah. So. Uh, she's writer than you were. <laughs> all right. So there's two kings that are talked about in here. All right. Verse. Uh, yeah. So it's the parable and the application. In the parable and in the although it's less in the application, but in the parable you see there are two kings. The word of the Lord came to me saying, "Son of man, propound a riddle." And hold on, I gotta do uh, something. Uh, son of man, propound a riddle and speak a parable to the house of Israel, saying, Thus says the Lord God, a great eagle with its great wings, long pinions, and full plumage of many colors came to Lebanon and took away the top of the cedar. Okay, when you pay attention, that is Jeconiah. He's the guy that will go to Babylon and stay there. All right. Verse 4. He plucked off the topmost its young twigs and brought it, this is still Jeconiah, brought it to a land of merchants and set into the city of traders. He also took some of the seed of the land and planted it in fertile soil. This is going to be Zedekiah. Okay. He plants it in fertile soil. He placed it beside the abundant waters and he set it like a willow. Then it sprouted and became a low spreading vine with its branches turned toward him, but its roots remained under it. So it became a vine and yielded shoots and set out branches. Uh, by the way, in the image, does this plant need anything else? It doesn't need a thing. It's fine. It's growing. Everything's wonderful. And it's got this great eagle with full plumage to take care of it. But there was another eagle with great wings and much plumage. And behold, this vine bent its roots toward him and set out its branches toward him from the beds where it was planted that he might water it. It was planted in good soil beside abundant water that it might yield branches and fruit, bear fruit and became a splendid vine, become a splendid vine. Say, thus says the Lord God, will it thrive? Will he, that's the first one, number one, not pull it up pull up its roots and cut off its fruit that it withers so that all its sprouting leaves wither and neither by great strength nor by many people can it be raised from its roots again. Behold, though it is planted, will it thrive? Will it not completely wither as soon as the east wind strikes it wither on the beds where it grew? Okay, so there's the image. Now the application. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Say now to the rebellious house, Do you not know what these things mean? Behold, 
the king of Babylon came to Jerusalem, took its king and princes and brought him to Babylon. That's Jeconiah. He goes to Babylon. He took one of the royal house and made a covenant with him, putting him under oath. He also took away the mighty in the land. So he, he takes Jeconiah to Babylon. He takes Zedekiah and he makes him under oath. Now this is the important part. Turn to 2 Chronicles. In 2 Chronicles, we understand, so verse, uh, chapter 36. 2 Chronicles 36, verse 13, he, that's Zedekiah, rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear, now here's the key words in it, by God. But he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart against him. Okay, so understand back here in Ezekiel 17, when Nebuchadnezzar makes this deal with Zedekiah, the deal is by God. Okay, that's the important part. But he rebelled, verse 15. He rebelled. No, I need to write uh, verse 13. He took one of them, of the royal family, made a covenant with him, putting him under an oath. He also took away the mighty land, the king, that the kingdom might not be in subjection, might, excuse me, might be in subjection. Get this. If Zedekiah had stayed under the oath, the result would have been the kingdom would have remained in subjection. Last week we talked about there were going to be more punishment for them because they rejected Nebuchadnezzar. If they hadn't rejected Nebuchadnezzar, they could have stayed in the land. At least some of them could have, right? Verse 15. But... He rebelled against him by sending envoys to Egypt that it might give, give him horses and many troops. Will he succeed? Will he who does such things escape? Can he indeed break the covenant and escape? As I live, declares the Lord God, surely in the country of the king who put him on the throne, whose oath he despised and whose covenant he broke, in Babylon he shall die. Pharaoh, with his mighty army and great company, will not help him in the war when they cast up ramps and build siege walls and cut off many lives. Now he despised the oath by which, by breaking the covenant, and behold, he pledged his allegiance, yet in all these things he shall not escape. Verse 19, therefore, thus says the Lord, Lord God, as I live, surely my oath, which he despised, and my covenant, which he broke, I will inflict on his head. He made a deal with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar said, you swear by your God. And Zedekiah said, okay, I'll swear by my God. And then, as though that meant nothing to him, and consequently, God, Jehovah, looks unimportant to Nebuchadnezzar. And that's where the problem is. You said, by God. Well, you don't care about your God. Your God must not be important. If you don't think your God is important, I sure don't think your God is important. When in reality, this God happens to be the only God and the most important one. And so God has to come in and say, well, it's time for a correspondence course, as we say. Of course, the New Testament tells us what about our language, not James 3 either. Let our, our yes be yes. I'm a Christian. I do what I say. Why do you do what you say? Well, because I'm a Christian. Okay. So you better go out and live that way. Second Peter, last passage I have. Maybe you have something else. Second, uh, First Peter, chapter two. First Peter, chapter two, verse nine. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy possession, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, and the number one excellency of Jesus, of Jehovah, is he always keeps his word. That, that's the, when God reveals this word, this name Jehovah, the context is, I keep my word. For you were once not a people, but now you are a people. Verse 11, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against your soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, including keeping your word. I said I'll do it, and so I'll do it. So that in a thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Hey, 
I know a thousand people out there, most of them won't keep their word. But those Christians over there, they, they keep their word. That must reflect back on their God and they give God glory or they will. Comments or questions? I'm all done for tonight. I have a question of clarification. This is what confused me about this chapter. God will punish Zedekiah for rejecting his. That's lower case, a, lower case H. In other words, God will punish Zedekiah for rejecting Zedekiah's oath with, oath with Babylon. This punishment is not necessarily because God willed it to be so and Zedekiah was being belligerent about it. It's because Zedekiah made a commitment of his own accord for his own purposes and then failed to keep it. Correct? That is the immediate cause. Okay. But it fits into a greater context, and the greater context is God had already told them, all the nations, remember when they show up in Jeremiah 25 or something like that, all the envoys of the nations show up because Nebuchadnezzar is coming, and they're there to form an alliance. And God says to them, you nations, if you submit to Nebuchadnezzar, you can stay in your land. But if you don't submit to Nebuchadnezzar, you will get kicked out of your land, your nation will be destroyed. So, God knew what was going to happen, but Zedekiah at the same time breaks this oath, and that is the vehicle in which God will actually destroy Jerusalem. Anybody else? Anything else? Thank you for your work. I have no idea who has songs tonight, but the person who does know is raising his hand right now. So we're all right.